You are listening to Science Coast with Mallory Havens and Chris White. And today our guest is Mark Swain. Mark, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I, uh, I've been teaching art and design, mostly art, uh, for 25 years here at Lewis, but I am currently the interim dean of the College of Humanities, Fine Arts, and Communications. So today we want to talk about whether or not people are born into being a scientist, born into being an artist, or whether there's, you know, effort that is required. In other words, is everybody the same when they're born and they can become an artist through appropriate training? Um, and, and one of the analogies might be athletics. There are certain humans that are just genetically more adept at throwing the ball into the hoop or <laughs> running 100, 100 meters really, really fast, much faster than I could ever do it. So is it similar with science and art? So, Mark, have, do you believe in talent in artistic fields? I do believe in talent in artistic fields, but I'm sort of cautious to say that. I don't say that very often. I don't use the word talent very often. Um, and the reason being is, is that I do believe that it, 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 you, you can learn to become a good artist and maybe even a great artist. That said, I think that there is that kind of um, innate, um, uh, you know, that, that innate, uh, what's the word? Um, you're born, I guess, <laughs> you're born with an innate um, ability, ability. Uh, and, and, a, and a creativity and a zeal for, um, for art making and being a creative person. And, um, you know, if, as you mature, if you, if you are, I guess, disciplined enough to sort of leverage that, um, then you, you arguably are going to be a better artist than someone who doesn't have that innate ability. So I think that that's true. But that said, I, you certainly, um, if you don't have that, you can still be a, um, a, a wonderful artist and learn how to become one. So drive and passion is almost like a prerequisite. If you don't have drive and passion, then it's going to be very difficult to get to, you know, um, you know, the, the upper echelons of any discipline. Um, but then I think a lot of it is just unleashing. I know in physics, a lot of it is just unleashing, giving uh, a potential a student an opportunity to develop. And there has to be opportunities for, for, you know, budding artists as well, where you let them, you know, you know, let them open up to become the artist that is inside of them, but just trapped and locked inside. Is, is that making any sense at all? Yeah, I think similar to probably science and other disciplines, you know, that nature nurture thing, you know, a lot of people, artists, you know, Grammy winners, they get up and they, or, or Oscar winners, they get up and they, they thank someone who was a mentor to them. So there, it's that kind of perfect uh, equation where they, they have that innate ability, they have that drive, um, and then they also have that kind of nurturing environment, whether it's parents or, or a mentor or someone that, that, that push them. Um, and those are the ones that, you know, often rise um, to a, a very high level. So um, I think often it takes, you know, at least two of those three things, let's say, for that to happen, if that answers your question. So, Mark, why did you become an artist? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like maybe I did have some of that innate. It was in my personality. I was, I was a thinker and I was distracted visually all the time. I was looking around. My parents thought I was, something was wrong with me, <laughs> but I just, I, I, I really, think everyone's parents. I, think I, that, I yeah. relate to that. <laughs> yes. 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 And it's, yeah, it's not uncommon, but, um, so I always drew, um, I actually would draw from mad magazine all the time. Mm. I was a big fan of mad magazine. Uh, Sergio Argonias, um, Don Martin, to name a couple, um, and so I was copying that stuff. I was I was it would draw the peanuts. Um, I loved cartoons, and my mom's an artist, and I have a lot okay. of artists in my family. So my mom's a painter, and so I I got to uh, you know sort of witness that from a very early age, watching her with her easel and doing paintings. Um, so, it, you know, and then just to sort of shorten the story, I got to Lewis and I was enrolled as a nursing major oh. and I took a painting class with Paul Mitchell here at Lewis, who's now retired. And, you know, he became a mentor to me and he inspired me. And 
And once I got painting and got drawing, there was no stopping. So that's that's why I'm here. I've been reading articles that say that there are physical differences um, between artists and, for example, the general public. So if you were to take you know renowned artists and do physical examinations on them, uh, what comes out is the fine motor skills for artists are superior to that of the general population. And when they do brain scans, they find that you know, the development of certain areas of the brain are more advanced in uh, artists than they are in the general population. And so one of the questions, and maybe (laughs) Mallory can help us understand this, is uh, are these types of things, um, uh, can you develop them? Can you develop fine motor skills uh, beyond the, you know, the, the, the norm for the average population? Or can you develop your brain in ways uh, so that it, that it, 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 it grows yeah, for sure. There's neuronal plasticity. That's how your brain changes after you're born. So think about like a stroke victim. They can completely rewire their brain and relearn skills that used to be housed in a region that's dead now. But you can relearn that in a different region. So the more you use certain circuitry, physically the connections grow. So if you're using the same neurons firing to each other repeatedly, you're going to create more synapses. So grow more physical connections. You're going to put more receptors there to receive the signals. So any part of your brain you work out like a muscle will grow. And yeah, you can learn dexterity and improve your muscles in your hands. Your feet actually have the same abilities to do what your hands do. We just don't train them. So if you have seen people who lack hands or arms, they can do everything with their feet that we do with our hands. So it's just a matter of investment in developing skills, I think. So it's not too late. I can still become an artist? You can. I think so. Uh oh. You might not be a great one. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, really. I mean, and, and that's it's that's great and thank you for that explanation. I mean, why why do we do what we do? I mean, what you know, um obviously there are different styles of art and there are different tendencies. Like I love abstract expressionism, I love min- minimalism, especially. Um if I go and this is not directly answering uh, what you're talking about either, Chris, but if I go and I, and I mimic or I make an abstract expressionist painting, it's, it's not genuine. It's not from my heart. It's not from my mind. It, it doesn't, um, fulfill, um, the, the kind of nuance that I embrace as an artist. So it's, 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 also interesting how you sort of settle into a style or into tendencies and it probably has a lot to do with the way that your brain is being sort of um developed and and led you know and what you invest in so so the word that came to my mind was personality so you're saying that the art that an artist creates um has personality just like the artist himself herself has absolutely for sure definitely and if you think about it like a painter isn't going to suddenly be the world's best choreographer or, you know, a Grammy award-winning musician isn't, you know, there are very few EGOTs right. out there. Um, what is that? Uh, Emmy, Grammy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. Yes. Right. Um, and then you think, I'm not a physicist. You're not a biologist. Yeah. So everybody has their subspecialty and it doesn't translate across all fields. And then when you get into biology, I'm not a microbiologist. I'm a molecular biologist. I'm not an anatomist. I'm not an evolutionary biologist. Well, we all follow our passions. Right. You know, what we personally have, we find interesting. And what I find interesting isn't the same as what other people find interesting. And I'm reminded of that all the time on a daily basis. <laughs> um, but Mark, something that I would be interested in hearing more about, cause I've heard, and I think it's somewhat related is I've heard you comment before about creativity and artistic ability not necessarily being the same thing. Right. Yes. Um, Yeah. You could, you could easily, and and the example that I've given before is how well biology students here at Lewis do in a painting class. And that's a generalization, but it's, it's pretty true over 25 years. And so they go through, they understand color theory, they complete the projects at a high level, they even complete a very complex project, which is a self-portrait, at very high levels. They put an enormous amount of time in, into this work. And, and even if they're not biology majors, the, the other people that do it that way. And I think it's because they, they can follow a step process, they can understand information that's being given to them they learn quickly how to do those tasks and they can also focus for long periods of time and they're disciplined enough to do that. 
and they also want to see that sort of experiment or that project through to completion. So they understand the the, the finished product and they want to get there. So they're they're motivated by that. Um, I think where they where they sort of get an awakening is is then if they take that new artistic skill and they try to apply it to a project of their own or an idea of their own, they stumble because now you're asking them to create something from nothing. So rather than being prompted and doing a project, now it's like, okay, make a painting. And they're like, well, what do you mean? What do you want me to paint? It's like, I don't know. You decide. And that's the creati- creativity piece and, and trying to sort of put the two together. Okay, I've got this skill, these skill sets. I could go ahead and mobilize myself and make a piece of art. But do I, do I have the capacity to create that piece of art from nothing? Yeah, I like painting and doing pottery, but I find myself doing the same thing that I've always done. I actually was talking to somebody I hadn't spoken to in about 20 years, knew them when they were a kid, and they said, oh, you taught me how to draw goldfish. And I said, oh, I still draw goldfish <laughs> in the exact same way. Yeah. And like, But I, I enjoy c- making and creating, but I that whole genuine, like something totally brand new, and art doesn't arise in me as easily as thinking of a whole new scientific experiment. And building creativity in STEM professionals is something that people are realizing needs to be done at, from an earlier and earlier age. And the having creative ability uh, will help every human being as they go through their life. If they can live their life in a creative fashion, uh, everybody benefits. And so I've been reading an awful lot about how um, science education STEM education in general would benefit if we could incorporate artistic creativity training into the curriculums and that by neglecting it, um, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. Oh, yeah, for sure. The reason I draw goldfish is because an elementary school teacher, art teacher, brought in goldfish on each of our table and told us to draw them and paint them. And so I did that then, and I still do it now. (laughs) So so I wasn't even creative then. Someone told me to do it. So uh, go ahead, Mark. I agree with that wholeheartedly, Chris. And um, it just reminds me of uh, the first day of graduate school at NIU. I had a committee of three people, and Dr. Ball, Walter Ball, back back when you could get a PhD in painting, his was from Ohio State. But... um, he, he got a group of us together in a sort of class, and it was a painting class, and he said, uh, okay, and, and he talked in this real sort of like um, deadpan way. He got us all together, about 15 of us, and he said, okay, well, well, we'll meet for a critique in two and a half weeks, and Northwestern and UIC will be there. We'll meet up in the annex, um, so I'll see you all there uh, 3 o'clock, and he left, and that was the first day of class. So everyone <laughs> looked around and said, what are we supposed to do? And the answer was, is we were supposed to make art with yeah. no directions at all. Right. Just go back to your studio and make work so that in two and a half weeks you could present that work to this group. And, and it was like my heart like sank. I'm like, there are no prompts, no directions. <laughs> like, how am I going to stack up with these people? Like what? So we started talking amongst ourselves, which I think is what he wanted to have happen. Right. You know? and to generate ideas amongst the group and then go back to your studio and start to begin to create. Were you all painters or? Uh, Pretty much, yes. That group was all painters of some sort. So at least you knew what medium you were supposed to use. (laughs) Yeah, we we had no direction, and and so we were being tested. Like, like, did we have the confidence to go back and make a couple paintings or a painting and then put it in front of this group, including the faculty and everybody else? And and, and believe me, when we did, I mean, they they would rip it apart. Sure, Absolutely yeah. rip it apart. Is that so is it so I think what I'm hearing is the difference between being innovative and creative and being proficient. So you can be proficient in that you can say, hey, reproduce this and I can reproduce it just fine. But if it's like, okay, create something new that is completely different and of your own thought, that's a different skill set. If you want to put it in science analogies, it's the difference between being a research technician and doing experiments that you're told to do or like a lab analyst versus a primary investigator lead analyst who's getting the overarching ideas and designing the whole plan. So it's like if you can be at that lower level in art where you're just reproducing things or 
doing what you're told versus generating all of those new ideas. And that's got to take the same amount of training to go through the educational system that it takes in the sciences to achieve that. It's exactly the same thing. Pretty much exactly the same thing. And it's the same process. It's very similar to how since um, since the Renaissance, you know, creative individuals have been uh, tapped to go ahead and work for commerce, work for the church, work for corporations. So often creative people hit a fork in the road. Do I go ahead and become a fr- fr- uh, an artist, you know, yeah. and a free thinker, or do I use my uh, talents uh, for profit? Profit, exactly. <laughs> Well, you have been, or sorry, you've been listening to Science Coast. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the speaker's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of Lewis University. The material and information presented here is for general information purposes only. The Lewis University name and all forms and abbreviations are the property of its owner, and its use does not imply endorsement of or opposition to any specific organization, product, or service. This podcast was produced in the WLRA podcast studios at Lewis University. Visit lewisu.edu for more information about Lewis University. I'm Mallory Havens. And I'm Chris White. And I'm Mark Swain. Thanks for listening. Bye.